we are living in an exciting time, perhaps even a revolutionary time, actually, one in which IT is starting to touch the lives of more and more people as never before. Smartphones, pads, laptops, TV, even GPS finders. IT is actually impacting on our lives in, in a very personal way, and it's about personal enablement, and you guys are responsible for creating a lot of that content. This uh, society of devices, if you like, which, by the way, is the real cloud, um, needs an infrastructure to work its magic. And so the question becomes, how can we support such an infrastructure and develop that infrastructure with a pace of change that matches the, the rate at which this personal enablement craves innovation from us? This is an area that I've been researching for nearly 20 years now, and don't ask how that happened. I really don't know. Um, and through CF Engine, we've actually been able to implement some of these ideas and change even the way, in some small part, as that the industry thinks about these problems. But there are still large areas of IT management or large areas of the IT uh, space that know nothing about these kinds of uh, approaches. And I would like to tell you a little bit this morning about just the status of these approaches and how we can... Uh, and how I see it going forward. So, actually, IT management, IT change management, is in some sort of crisis at the moment, uh, deeply divided between uh, companies who wanting agility to be able to implement things very quickly, driven by innovation, and other companies who fear the risks of such change. And we have to remember that there are two kinds of change. There's intended change and unintended or unexpected change. And both of these are handled today in pretty much the same way, which is with a great deal of suspicion. So let's do a test. Um, imagine you see a child drowning in the river. What do you do? One of two options. Do you, one, jump into the river immediately and try to save the drowning child? Or do you, two, fill out a request for change form, submit it to your middle management for approval, to find a suitable remediation window, uh, of course, only after a suitable really lengthy root cause analysis. This kind of typifies the two uh, approaches to change management we see in the industry today, depending on what kind of company you are. And I think the central point is that change management today is dominated by fear of liability, not really dealing with the actual risks. So, Two things affect our ability to change, and we can call them for fun, mass, and velocity. Why not? This is mechanics. It's Newton's laws, right? There is speed itself. There is nothing to fear but speed itself. We have to move fast enough to get out of the way of threats, to beat competitors, to avoid drifting off course when something goes wrong. It's like the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland. You, know, you have to run very, very fast just to stand still, and if you want to get anywhere else, you have to run twice as fast as that. So we need speed in order to be able to achieve goals, to correct errors, and to respond to changes in the environment. But of course, speed should not come at the, ex at the expense of predictability. And then there's the counterpoint to that, which is mass, bulk, and this also comes in two forms. It has a double-edged double sword. It has useful weight, which is maybe muscle to, you know, CPU power to drive, uh, drive the system, keep it going. But there's also dead weight. There is bureaucracy. There is change pro process management, change management, which just really contributes nothing towards the goals. It's really just uh, stopping us from achieving those goals very quickly. The bigger the mass, the slower the change, the harder you fall. So on this slide, Let's look at two approaches to risk. What does risk actually mean? What are we trying to avoid when we're making changes? Here are two approaches to flight. These two aircraft take different approaches to, um, to risk management. Uh, the, the glider sees risk as being falling out of the sky, losing power and having to fall, being falling out of the sky because it's not a, no longer able to fly. It has a fairly sedate approach to change management because the environment is pretty constant around it. It's sort of an insurance company or a bank, somebody that perceives a fairly constant environment, not much changing very fast. 
it's about compliance and complying with the, the, the general frameworks and environment around you. The fighter, on the other hand, sees change as being a missile coming out of nowhere or another fighter jet coming in to challenge it. It's all about competition and risk and change and, and speed. So it needs to be able to generate stability by responding uh, instantly, turning on a penny and really uh, using its ability to change very, very fast to become stable in that very changing dynamical environment. And the fighter jet is interesting because it blurs the distinction between intended and unintended change. When the wind buffets this flight, this, this plane, it doesn't, just, uh, it doesn't just accept it, it corrects, the computer corrects it. And of course, this kind of change requires very fast automation. Humans cannot do this without help. Well, what, what enabled this kind of change to take place? How do we, how do we make this kind of automation? Um, how do we succeed in this kind of area? I think an important thing happened at the end of the 1980s, which was uh, the emergence of free software. It was kind of a Berlin Wall moment for software development, where uh, previously we had no control over the software being developed. It was all in large companies. If we wanted a change, we had to ask them nicely for those changes to be made. But then suddenly the walls were down and we were able to make our own software. We were able to contribute ideas to that process, dynamically change things. And that was at the time when I, gener when I created the first CF engine. Back then, the idea was that uh, the main challenge we had to face was handling the diversity of all the different kinds of Unix. And there were many, many more flavors of Unix back then, and there were many more, they were very, very different, of course. But then gradually the story changed. We get used to this ability to have innovation. And through the 90s, uh, I came up with an idea of computer immunology that you know, just installing systems is not good enough. Somehow you need to be able to maintain them as well. You need to be able to adapt, to dynamically adapt, to change them. And so through the 90s, we came up with self-healing computing systems. Uh, autonomic, uh, autonomics that IBM came up with a little bit later on was taking on the same kind of idea. And then we come all the way up to today where the politics have somehow fallen out of the Berlin Wall moment of the free software and open source and commerce have made friends. And today the, the cool companies are the ones that uh, use open source, enable um, companies to change very, very fast and adapt and innovate by merging this development in with their infrastructure. And so we're talking about things like DevOps, rebranding some of these ideas in a commercially friendly way, which is incredibly important because this is what is driving the freedom, the personal enablement that uh, we were alluding to a moment ago. But some people are afraid of automation. Still, most companies today do things by hand, surprisingly enough. And back in the 1950s, science fiction writer Isaac Asimov was, in, was observing a similar tendency in the time of industrialization. And he pointed out that it was very depressing that you know, people would reject technology simply out of fear. Why reject change? We need uh, automation. So he created these robot stories to teach us lessons about how technology can be made safe. I'm sure you, most of you know these stories. He came up with three laws of robotics, three promises that robots had to keep in order for humans to be able to trust them and work with them. And I wrote these in, in CF Engine pseudocode just for fun. The three laws of CF, en uh, CF Engine, the three laws of robotics, pardon me, Freudian slip there. Uh, three, the three laws of robotics were, of course, that robots shouldn't harm human beings, they should always follow orders, and they should protect themselves because they're kind of expensive bits of hardware. And based on these rules, these robots would be able to serve humanity in a, in a good way, in a predictable way. And through that predictability, we get trust, and that enables us to use them in an optimum way. I took this kind of idea and applied it to infrastructure management, change management, um, by really looking at examining the way in which we make changes. This slide tries to explain a little bit about what a lot of places are still doing wrong in terms of change management. The classical approach to change management is to wrap lots of processes around change and uh, document everything very carefully. 
But when you want to make a major change, what you do is you, you obliterate what you have and you rebuild something new in the correct model. So you know, how many sysadmins does it take to change a light bulb? Actually, quite a few, because you first have to tear down the building in which the light bulb exists to a new baseline, and then you rebuild a new building with a light bulb in it. This is the way we do change management. It's kind of stupid. Why not just screw in a light bulb? If you have surgical precision to be able to uh, make changes at a, small, uh, at a fine level, then you should be able to handle that kind of scenario. And so what I tried to introduce into CF Engine was the GPS approach to uh, change management, where you program the system with the desired state, the state that you want to get to, the destination you want to get to. And no matter where you start from, no matter what your starting state is, the automation will compute a new route to take you to that location. No matter how things change, and no matter how the environment buffets your glider or your fighter jet, the automation will make a correction and, and focus in on that final destination. So that was what I called this convergent approach, sometimes called idempotent, uh, slight misunderstanding um, of, of management. And I made this uh, cartoony picture just to parody this, uh, this disparity between forms of technology. On the left-hand side of this picture, you see men talking about their tools uh, as they bring in increasingly large uh, tools and, and uh, things to, to clear up a mess that's already happened. Whereas on the right-hand side of the picture, you see people sort of smiling and saying, you know, if you just installed a drain in the beginning, we would never have gotten into this mess in the first place. So we would like to have change taken care of by systems that are built with self-healing capabilities that can repair and respond to changes. And of course, we can change destination on our GPS. We can always make a, an intended change, and the system will adjust accordingly. So this doesn't hinder our ability to, to make changes in any way. There's another dimension to change management which is very often neglected, and that is scale and complexity. Complexity is another dimension uh, in the sense that organizations today really need cultural diversity. You know, mergers and acquisitions are, are forming companies uh, Shuffling, and, uh, shuffling companies like uh, nobody's business. Banks are acquiring other banks. Companies are acquiring other companies. Companies come and go, uh, divide up, they're distributed. There's really a huge variety of culture taking place in the commercial world, and we need to be able to handle that. The cultural diversity is a strength, human creativity, right? Not, there is no one correct answer that you can blast out to an entire organization, level the field by demolishing everything that's there and then replacing it. That's not a good way to manage human beings. It's a, it's a respectless way of handling human beings. So to be able to handle cultural diversity while maintaining desired state, managing it, repairing it, is an, ex is a, an important strength. Acquisitions are one thing, of course, the physical diversity of the cloud, all of these devices, is another aspect to this which we also have to handle. Today, we don't really handle complexity. We suppress it. We try to make all the machines the same. And that might work in so certain special companies where, which are very monolithic. They have maybe one main application. But most organizations are actually quite diverse. They have many lines of business. They have different departments, each with their own ideas and special needs. And we need to be able to tailor infrastructure to those special needs. So complexity is very important. How do we handle it? We, we handle it very simply by not tying things too tightly together. When you tie things very tightly together, you create brittle structures which tend to shatter when they, when they, when they fall. The looser things are coupled together, the fewer dependencies, the, e the easier it is for something to flex, like the wings of your plane. Um, they need to be plastic in order to take on the wind coming in. Uh, we have to be able to adapt systems by not tying them in a rigid structure. So keeping things loose is a very important part, and this was part of the CF Engine mentality, autonomy. Every machine for itself, every machine looks after its own uh, state. We don't tie things too closely together uh, so that if something goes wrong, they're fault tolerant. Well, lots of ways of looking at it, but the, ul the ultimate uh, point is that independence is a strength because independence allows greater flexibility. 
It allows you to distribute things. It allows you, uh, it makes it easier to comprehend the system as well. But it also has a, a flip side, which is that by achieving scale and complexity, we maybe en end up with a situation where we actually don't comprehend the monster we've created. And so my last point is that where do we need to go today? Where do we need to go tomorrow? It's really about knowledge now. Because once you've made automation that is capable of separating human decision making from consistent implementation, what you're left with is just human knowledge. And the ability to model that human knowledge, to understand it in a good way, is what will make us succeed with infrastructure tomorrow. Robots will help us to implement it. They'll be safe and trustworthy because they keep good promises. But we still need them to uh, do something which is planned and coherent with respect to a, a large-term goal. And this is what human beings' role is going to be in the future. We need to take back that uh, control of the environment from instead of leveling things and making everything the same, we need to in embrace that uh, cultural diversity and make systems uh, support human beings instead of the other way around. We do that by putting humans in charge of the chemistry of things and using descriptive languages. Uh, the software can actually build a narrative about the system for you. If with a simple declarative language you can describe your infrastructure, knowledge management techniques can then build a picture of your system for you that you can explore, um, ask questions, and use to plan the future in a much stronger way than firefighting and reactive behavior. <coughs> Excuse me. So the challenge for us all, the challenge for you, the challenge for me, is to rehumanize IT management by putting control back into the hands of human beings, by putting the thinking back into human beings' uh, minds. Bring speed, but bring speed with predictability. Just like the GPS, you need to be able to recompute and focus in on your actual goals. And when we can do that, we'll be able to have precision, knowledge-based engineering of IT systems. And with that, I'll say thank you very much.